Thank you all for coming to this talk. I want to talk a bit about cloud strategies. And uh, I work at Cloudera, which means that when I talk about cloud strategies, I'm really going to talk about it in the context of data, data management, analytics, analytic applications, and how uh, you might want to think about those in the context of running in the cloud. Uh, I'll start with the obligatory market trend slide. Why is this talk relevant? Uh, because today for Cloudera and for most organizations, cloud is the fastest growing kind of infrastructure uh, in technology today. It's still smaller, as you can see by that chart on the left-hand side, than uh, traditional servers and storage, but it's growing much faster. And the forecast is that by 2019, between public and private cloud, uh, nearly 40% of all the uh, infrastructure is going to be either some mix of public cloud or private cloud. Uh, on the public cloud side, especially in North America, that's, uh, the public cloud is heavily dominated by a, a limited uh, number of providers. Um, most notably, it's been Amazon. But if you also look at the growth rate there, you'll see that Azure and Google uh, are growing at about double the rate, which means that in the fullness of time, uh, you'll probably see, we're already starting to see a couple different large uh, cloud providers that run in multiple regions that have pretty extensive product portfolios. And uh, further to reinforce the point, of course, is that there are now, uh, for government agencies, guidelines or recommendations that uh, agencies take a cloud-first approach uh, to new projects. So this isn't just a macro IT trend, it's also, uh, it's also a, a, an agency uh, guideline in many cases. Uh, on the Cloudera side, um, about 20% of our customers today run in the public cloud, some fraction more than that if you incorporate private cloud. So we're, our, the level of adoption that we're seeing for big data style applications in the cloud is actually a higher rate than what we see for applications generally. Uh, this is just a cross section of some of the organizations that run us wholly or entirely in one of the major public cloud providers. Uh, and you can see there's really no uh, dividing line in terms of organization size or in terms of uh, uh, or in terms of industry. I don't have the government agencies up here because I didn't know which ones we had under what NDA consideration, so I left those off. But we've also had government agencies uh, that are using us both in GovCloud and Amazon. And I think there's even some Azure examples as well at this point. Now, uh, in order for me to talk about how you should think about doing data management in the public cloud, uh, I, need, I, need I want to convince you that uh, one of the ways you need to think about this is by thinking about the kinds of applications uh, or the kinds of capabilities that you want to uh, that you want to run, uh, because the nature of what you're going to do is going to look fairly different depending. In the scope of what uh, we cover at Cloudera, and in fact most of the, the uh, technology vendors at this conference, we really cover kind of these four classes of applications that you see here. Uh, we get used a lot for. Uh, predictive analytics applications, data science use cases, for example. We get used a lot for traditional analytic database reporting and BI type use cases. We get used for a specific subset of real-time applications, online applications. And then the, the kind of the building block that all of them leverage, uh, on, uh, that underpin all of this is a lot of data engineering, a lot of just collecting, massaging, manipulating, joining, organizing, pre-processing data. That's what makes all these other different applications possible. So these four different workloads. Uh, and now really, these are all just different configurations of the same platform, right? So uh, the platform that we develop is essentially, you know, it comes from this Apache open source ecosystem and it's all integrated together as one system that you can download and use. And then you can configure it to do any of the aforementioned kind of four applications that you saw previously. So uh, the first thing you might note uh, is that if I think about running this software on, on fixed infrastructure, meaning traditional servers that I own, uh, or perhaps I'm running in the public cloud, but I'm just, I'm not auto scaling or you know, uh, doing anything particularly elastic, I'm just kind of running on fixed infrastructure. What you would find to be the most common pattern uh, is that typically if you have more than one application, which most organizations do, where possible, you start to think about having multiple disparate applications uh, configured as different tenants in one environment. And there's really two reasons why you do that. The first reason why you do that is cost. So the physical cost of, 
of purchasing lots of servers. I'd rather not have to do that for each distinct application. That's uh, just to give you a sense, normally when you think about the total cost of a big data system, roughly two out of three dollars is spent on the physical infrastructure and one out of three dollars is spent on the software. So, so the physical infrastructure drives budget considerations, uh, cost considerations far more than the software does. So therefore, what's one of the reasons why if I've got one new application, where possible, I'd rather make that a new tenant um, on an existing environment than I would create a new environment. The second reason why I would do this is because where possible, I would like to see some sharing of data. Most interesting analytic applications require that I bring together different data sources. It's rare that you find something interesting off a single data source. It's more common that you find something when you combine a collection of sources. And so the motivation is to constantly find ways to consolidate data because it's the interrelationship between data that generates insight. So those are the two reasons why you tend to find people bringing more and more tenants to a single environment. But then when you look at how things tend to run in the public cloud or the private cloud, you find that people create, stamp out many more purpose-built environments, single application environments. So different way to set up compared to the way you're looking at things when you talk about <clears throat> running on fixed infrastructure. Why do you do this? Two reasons. First is the public cloud providers, the nature of the infrastructure I can consume, I can control the cost a little better than I can if it's fixed infrastructure. So for example, I can have just the right number of instance types, I can size the instance types to just the amount of footprint that I need, uh, I can run them for only as long as I need, and all of these things make it more uh, realistic from a cost perspective to consider creating different independent environments, which previously I would have discouraged. The second reason why you see this is more common in public cloud is because we have an alternate way to share data, which is that we can have different applications leverage the same cloud storage as a way of uh, handling interchange between data sets, between applications. Now, there's some uh, limits to that, which I wanna get into, so this isn't a fully solved problem, but these are the two reasons why you tend to find in the public cloud uh, maybe you might have several dozen distinct environments, whereas on fixed infrastructure, you might find that you really only have two or three production environments because you're trying to group as many things together as possible. But um, in either case, when you think about, uh, when you think about uh, either configuring entirely as different tenants in a shared environment or whether you talk about creating specialized environments on cloud infrastructure, in either case, uh, and in fact, maybe even more emphasized in the public cloud, uh, open source is, uh, open platforms are still, I think, a really important part uh, of one strategy. Um, and why is that the case? Well, the first is that in the public cloud side, it's a fast changing environment. Uh, the number of new offers that are announced with any given day, week, or month is uh, a really exciting pace. You have more options, and the nature of your options is changing year on year. And so there's a real attraction in, a in an open platform is one that can run on multiple clouds. So you can take advantage of whatever new services or features or discounts or what have you are on offer. Second thing is, if I'm going to be experimenting with a lot of different kinds of infrastructure, I'm going to be having some things in public cloud, some things in private cloud, some things on fixed infrastructure, I really want to make sure that my applications and all of my uh, GOTS and COTS tools and applications that run on top of these platforms, that that works irrespective of what type of infrastructure I choose to use. So the idea of a platform that supports a really big open ecosystem we think is really important too. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there's, still cons there's still the desire to say, well, I'm going to be making these applications. They need to last for a very long time. I'm concerned about lock-in. I want to be able to have a diverse array of vendors that can support this technology. And so having the platform itself be open source is a nice advantage. And it turns out the federal government agrees with me too. Uh, there's also, uh, just like there's a guideline around the cloud first, there's also a guideline around open source first. Uh, and, and so uh, I, mention, I emphasize this here because if you look at a lot of the different options that you see in the public cloud side today, um, there's, uh, it's a much newer world, uh, there's much less standardization, and uh, there are far more proprietary options uh, than there are open source options these days if you look at the cloud side. Uh, we think that'll change over time, but that's kind of what the mix of things are currently. So uh, how do you actually optimize for cost and convenience? So that's what I want to talk about really. If I asked, if I said, what's going to, um, uh, what's going to be materially different 
between uh, your experience doing data management on, 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 on fixed infrastructure versus in the cloud, there's a lot of things which are the same. And there's a few things which are different. And the things that are materially different, the things you're really trying to optimize for where you can come out ahead if you're talking about a cloud environment compared to on fixed infrastructure, is you can find opportunities to run it at less cost, not always, but often. Uh, and you can find opportunities to make it more convenient, uh, easier for your internal customers, easier for your internal users uh, to, get, to get to the finished result they were striving for sooner and faster than they previously would have. So, in each case, though, the nature of what cost and convenience means varies from application to application. So, for example, if you think about data science and data engineering applications, these are these kind of big, batchy processing type of applications, right? They've got a beginning and an end, whether it's uh, transforming data, right? So I, like, I, I, I launch a job or a series of jobs, I manipulate data, I produce some finished result. Uh, or I'm scoring a model, same, same situation. Either one of these cases, the nature is that it's batch and it tends to be high scale. Um, what is that, uh, so what does that mean in terms of cost and convenience when you, look at, uh, when you look at public cloud? Well, cost is a really evident one, right? So if I've got some large data processing uh, application that I need to run, and the nature of it is batch, and let's say I need to run it once a day or three times a day, five times a day, then what I might want to do is I might want to find a way to shut off the environment in the off hours and reclaim the compute costs. And if you kind of do the math on that, if you were, let's say, running some batch, like if your main application was an ETL pipeline, you were running that uh, for four hours a day, uh, and if you were able to shut off the infrastructure in the off hours, you could cut the total cost of that environment by about 50% compared to what you would have done if you were on fixed infrastructure. So that's kind of the most clearest example I could give in terms of cost. The, uh, and then the other, uh, the other opportunity is in terms of convenience. And in terms of convenience, what you find is that with a lot of these data science uh, and data engineering applications is that you've got different developers that are building different ones. And they oftentimes want to favor different versions of different libraries, different versions of different tools. And in a shared environment, you might have had to standardize that, force everybody to use the same version. But in this environment where you've got different segregated uh, clusters uh, that are all purpose built, you can let each development team leverage the version they want. As long as they're able to share data with one another, you're more or less happy with that outcome. So greater convenience for the engineers, uh, potentially lower cost, uh, when, you, uh, when, when you consider uh, the idea of shutting off these environments in the off hours. Um, the, uh, other big, uh, uh, the other big advantage that you find in terms of convenience is the idea of um, optimizing and isolating individual workloads. So one of the things you also find is that uh, my example previously is a little contrived, right? Most people don't just have an application which just processes data, one run, that's it, nothing else. Like, that's kind of an oversimplified example. What may be the case, however, is you've got lots of ad hoc business intelligence type work going on, different users doing ad hoc queries. You've got some ad hoc uh, interactive data science work going on, and then you've got a couple big batch uh, processing runs that you do. And so what you could do, again, in this type of an environment is you can say, well, let's have my base load be this kind of persistent cluster that sticks around and I stays highly available and I want to have a very consistent, reliable performance for my users, but then I can segregate out this big batch cycle and I can run that in a dedicated environment and that way I don't have to size my base environment for peak load. So that's another example of uh, where you can save cost and also deliver some convenience. Um, now, if you look at an analytic database use case, so this would be something like a business intelligence use case or some kind of a ad hoc SQL and reporting and analysis type of a use case, the nature of the cost and the convenience that you're striving for uh, is going to look materially different. So um, what's the convenience that we're trying to deliver? Um, one of the big bits of convenience that we'd like to deliver in the cloud uh, is again this notion of can I, uh, can I deliver a higher quality of service to users by segregating the production pipelines from the interactive work. So uh, if, those, if any of you guys run uh, data warehouse appliances in, in any of your agencies, so like an Atiza appliance, a Teradata appliance, Exadata, anything like that, if you talk to your users, what I suspect they'll tell you is that uh, they know when the big production queries run during the day. 
Uh, they know this because they've made a point to avoid doing their work during those hours of the day because they know that they're a lower priority and they wind up getting squeezed or sideswiped by the production runs that go through. So it's a strange idea, right? You've got a multi-million dollar appliance and your users actually have to put a marker on their calendar for like what hours of the day uh, they're going to use the environment based on when it's busy and when it's not. One of the neat ideas with the cloud is you can basically relieve that constraint. You can essentially say, that's fine. You can run your production processing work at the exact same time that someone's doing something that's very experimental and ad hoc. And the reason why you do that is you basically just segregate these into two different clusters. So instead of having one cluster where you try to smooth the work out throughout the 24 hours to get maxim maximal utilization, instead of what you do is basically allow them the work to stack on top of one another from a time perspective. But it's okay because I've segregated them, so I'm not going to worry about one slowing down the other. And second of all, I can shut both down if I need to. So that way, the, the total amount of compute I'm using is basically equivalent. But the difference is I'm getting, con I'm getting the convenience benefit of knowing what hour of the day, of basically being able to run it whatever hour of the day I want, as opposed to making people adjust their schedules based on uh, increasing our utilization. The uh, other uh, interesting opportunity when it comes to convenience uh, within a linked databases, a lot of times what you find is you've got multiple different teams or departments that all want to leverage the same environment. And today the way that works is that there's a whole bunch of features that are built into platforms like ours that have for scheduling and resource management. So I have four different departments and they all contribute to the cost of the system and then they each get a fourth of the resources and I have some scheduler that determines under what circumstances who gets extra resources and that's all fine. Invariably, though, that, looks, that stuff looks very uh, confusing and opaque to different departments. They don't really know why things are running faster or slower at any given hour of the day. And instead, what you can do is you can contemplate having different uh, new departments join where I stamp out a brand new Data Mart environment that leverages the exact same data as the previous environment. So in other words, I can have one common source data and I can have multiple logical systems all share that common source. So that way, each team, if they want to get started, they want their own environment, they effectively get their own environment, but you don't have to deal with fragmentation in terms of the underlying data. So that's another nice convenience to consider. The third one to consider from a cost perspective uh, is it's less likely that you're going to wind up shutting these environments down. Typically, there's some amount of analysis going on at all hours of the day. But um, usually it's more busy and less busy at different hours of the day. So typically there's a lot less going on at 2 in the morning than there is at 2 in the afternoon. So what I want to be able to do is resize dynamically. I want to be able to basically have an environment that handles a certain level of user activity from, let's say, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and a different level of user activity for the remaining hours. And in doing so, I can, I can fit and size the compute I'm spending uh, to make this more cost effective than I would if it was on fixed infrastructure. Lastly, operational database or kind of real-time databases. These are, uh, uh, these are things like stream processing applications or uh, databases that uh, back websites or, 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 or mobile applications. These are things where latency is a, a very, very uh, high concern. This might be if you're an Accumulo user, an HBase user, increasingly now a Kudu user. Um, for these kinds of applications, these are the ones that change the least when you look at cloud. And the reason is that these things tend to stay up all the time, so you don't really have any transients associated with it. Uh, and the load tends to be somewhat more uniform. And so there's some opportunity to resize based on time of day, but not a ton. Uh, the main opportunity in terms of cost here is how can we use cloud in to lower our cost in terms of the disaster recovery in the dev and test environments, right? So typically for every production real-time system you have, you have a test environment which might be sized similarly. You might have a DR environment as well. And those things can add up in terms of cost. One of the things we can do in cloud is that we can start to back up in DR to cloud storage and restore from cloud storage into different availability zones or different regions. Uh, and as a result, the ongoing carrying cost of our DR is just the storage, as opposed to today on fixed infrastructure, you have to pay the cost of the storage and the compute. Um, the convenience is for your development teams uh, who, uh, whenever they want to build new applications or whenever they want to test changes to an existing application. So if I want to build a new application, I can create a new large-scale cluster uh, in the public cloud in about 10 to 12 minutes. 
Uh, so much faster to create an environment, also much faster to clone an existing production environment. So what I can do if I'm a developer, I want to test a change to an existing cluster application. I can basically clone the entire production environment, create a replica of it down to the configuration, run all of my tests there, and then throw the whole thing away when I'm done. So the quality of the testing is much higher. Um, the ability to set up the test environment is much easier. Uh, and the, uh, the cost of the test environment is much less. So, uh, so I've talked about how we're striving for gains in terms of cost and convenience when we reimagine these different data management applications in the cloud. But then what I've also said is that the way that you try to look for those opportunities for lower cost or greater convenience, it looks different as you go from application to application. The big batch processing runs you optimize differently than you do the interactive user applications, which you optimize differently than you do the real-time applications. But uh, all of those, act all of those uh, uh, things, that, all those optimizations that I'm describing, they all tend to lead you towards uh, more specialized environments. Uh, more, more, so, so you're going from a world of maybe two or three production clusters to maybe 20 or 30 production clusters. But there's a bunch of problems with this that I've been uh, remiss in sharing with you. The, uh, one of the problems is, actually, um, uh, one of the problems is, uh, like I said before, uh, a lot of our, um, uh, a lot of organizations when it comes to analytics, the goal is to combine different data sets. So the more specialized these environments get, the more you feel like you're starting to recreate all of the data silos that you spent the better part of the last 10 years trying to break down. So how do we optimize for cost and convenience without recreating a couple dozen data silos in the process of doing so? Now I've mentioned that all of these can share the same raw cloud storage. So they can all dump their bits in the same uh, storage destination. But if you think about most of your users, the fact that a bunch of files and binary data happens to be in a bucket in S3 somewhere or ADLS somewhere, that's cold comfort, right? Most people don't know how to interpret that information, don't know what to do with it. Um, and moreover, if I wanted to have some sharing of this data, then I need to also think about permissions at a much more granular level. The other thing is, I've been oversimplifying things in terms of uh, saying, well, there's these data engineering applications, there's these analytic database applications. A lot of cases, the nature of the problems you're trying to solve don't fit nicely into one pattern or another. They're a combination of patterns. There's lots of applications that we do which are some part data processing, some part interactive, and some part real time. Uh, this is just one example of a risk management application which has a, a big data processing stage, uh, a big predictive analytics stage and an ad hoc BI stage. And I think over time, they're probably gonna add a real-time stage to it as well. So if I've now got all these different specialized environments tuned and optimized for cost and convenience that is unique to each pattern, then I say, well, how do I do these more sophisticated applications that don't fit cleanly uh, into one pattern or another? They're actually a combination. So um, you know, our vision for what this needs to look like uh, going forward is something like this. We want to basically try to make gains in two directions that are normally at odds with one another. The first is uh, gains in terms of user convenience, right? How do we make it possible for new departments, teams, and developers to build new applications faster and with uh, less friction and difficulty? And there the trend is clearly towards what you see in the middle, which is lots of different specialized environments that are more shrink-wrapped and more pre-tuned, pre-optimized for each workload. Less things for each user to figure out up front, more complementary tools and features needed to basically produce the kind of application they're trying to produce. But then the second goal that is something we want to, we want to simultaneously advance on is uh, more of an enterprise-wide goal, which is how do I ensure uh, uh, how do I preserve sharing of data? How do I maintain consistent governance across all the data I have, irrespective of the application? How do I have a common operational model that everybody else can leverage? How do I have a common uh, interface that I can secure? Um, how do I have a common security model uh, that, that still sits across all of this data? And these are all things which the individual teams in, in, these eight, in your agencies probably don't think a lot about, but most of you do. Uh, and there's a lot of shared infrastructure that's necessary in order to make that possible. So on the one hand, you see you've got all these different specialized environments that are very easy to stamp out, but there's this common substrate that they all leverage. 
Yes, they leverage the common storage that you find uh, that you can use in any of the major cloud providers, but they also need to leverage common schema because most users work with data that has rows and columns. They also need to have a common security model. I'm going to allow different people to leverage a common set of data. I'm going to need to be able to secure that. So that means that the, the security model is going to get pulled out of any one individual cluster, and the security model is going to become something that follows the data around wherever it goes. Uh, and then I want a common, uh, uh, a common data governance model. So, you know, all the different regulations and directives that I have to follow, I need to find some way to codify those and automate those. So I'm going to have a data governance model that used to belong to an individual cluster environment. That's now going to belong to multiple clusters and environments. Uh, and then lastly, I want a common operations model. So one of the things you can find with cloud is that the, quality, the, the cost and convenience you deliver can swing plus or minus 3x based on some pretty small choices that you make. So having a consistent operational model so that you can effectively manage those costs while ensuring that you have good uptime and good, good availability and all the other things that an ops team likes to care about, that's no small feat. So I don't want to create an ops nightmare if I now make it really easy for lots of departments to stamp out lots of new clusters. Uh, and as a result, we want to have a common operational model that spans all of this too. And then for the users, more and more, we want to make the individual clusters or platforms disappear, right? Those just become, they don't need to know anymore, they shouldn't need to know anymore uh, what cluster they're using. That just becomes a small implementation detail of their application. So these are some of the building blocks we think that need to come into play in order to produce an environment that gives you all the cost and convenience benefits that you're striving for in the public cloud while preserving the, um, the operational governance, security, and shared data uh, that's been a priority for uh, the whole while. That concludes my prepared remarks. I actually think I'm five minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, at least relative to the, uh, the timer says I took 25 minutes. I think we have 30. So I've probably got time for two questions and then we'll probably wrap for lunch. Any questions? Anything I shared? Everyone's just hungry? One question. Come on, one question, I'll let you go. So can you, you said part of this model is that customers pay for only what they use, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. You pay for what you use. That's the main point here in the AWS cloud technology. Uh, you, that's part of it. You, well, again, the pay for what you use, the, the main, one of the main points is like in order to try, if you want to run cloud less expensively than you run phys, on, on physical servers, you need to find some way where you shrink the compute footprint uh, as you go so that you only pay for you know the bare minimum that you're uh, that you're using if you run if you what you tend to find is that if you run uh, an, in a public cloud provider 24 hours a day steady load you'll typically pay more than you will if you're running on physical servers so yes yeah, so one piece is from a cost perspective you do want to resize and think about how you pay for what you use but the other point is is that really the biggest fee, the thing to optimize for is convenience. How much faster can you make it to develop a new application? How much faster can it be to bring a new team on to capitalize on a new data set? How much faster can you respond to a new mission? These are the things, uh, these are the things which are actually more important from my point of view than the cost story. Um, this is where cloud can, can really excel um, if you let it. But it all depends on understanding the nature of your application, understanding the nature of what your users are trying to do, and then understanding what, what convenience means for them, because it varies a lot as you go from application to application. Any other questions? One more. So a lot of what you talked about makes a lot of sense from like a CIO standpoint, right? Someone who's at the top of an organization, able to deal with all of their users and deal with all the organizational policies at once. But I think what most folks in this room probably represent is a part of an agency that has, a broader, that has a broader model, maybe it's federated, maybe it's not, maybe it's completely isolated and siloed. Uh, I guess, can you relate some of what you talked about to something uh, for a user more in that space? Yeah, well, so from my point of view, I mean, I, I could be mistaken. My, my observation has been, when I've, when I've talked to folks at um, various agencies, is that 
you know, even, even a department within an agency as large as some of the agencies we're talking about here still tend to have multiple teams, multiple applications. Uh, so th the, what, what you experience in one, one division of an agency winds up looking like a microcosm of a lot of the things I've described here. I think what, I, what I've definitely seen is there are more uh, different environments that are kind of physically or virtually you know, air, gapped for, air gapped from one another. In other words, there's more segregation that you tend to find in agencies than you do maybe in some corporate context. But that's, per that's, even fi that's, even, uh, that's perfectly fine in the cloud. It's, it's less effort, right? It's le if you want to allow different teams and agencies to, to create dedicated environments in each case, and you don't care a lot about data sharing, and you're going to have like, much more aggressive uh, ways of walling off access to data, like more like, um, like totally different encryption keys and things like this, that's fine. That's a simpler model, right? Then you're basically saying, I'm going to optimize for cost and convenience, all the things I described previously, and I just don't care as much about shared data or shared security uh, or shared operations, right? Um, so that's, that's totally fine. That's a more, you know, obviously that's a more expensive model over time, right? Like as you invariably wind up replicating data more often or you wind up creating, you know, maybe you might have consolidated some environments over time, you probably do less of that in that context. Um, but if that's the nature of the way the agency needs to run, then the agency's been funded to run that way, and, and that's a cost that the agency's decided it wants to bear. So that's, that's totally fine. Thanks for your question. Great. Well, thank you for your time and attention and your questions, and I hope to see more of you after this talk.